Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences and to our library. My name is Ivan Vejvoda. I'm a permanent fellow here and the head of the Europe's Futures program. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, host and introduce uh, Heather Graby, who's a fellow uh, of the Europe's Futures program this year, 22-23. Uh, as you know, we have our fellows in residence in September, but because of various circumstances, Heather could not present her research project, so uh, we found this uh, time in December to do that. She was here on other business in Vienna, so it's great to have Heather with us. Uh, Heather and I go a pretty long way back. I won't say how long. Um, uh, Heather has done uh, many things. Uh, she worked in the European Commission on EU enlargement when the uh, Finnish politician Olli Rehn was EU Commissioner for enlargement. A uh, very intensive period. As you know, enlargement is back en vogue, if I may put it that way, thanks to someone called Vladimir. And uh, the European Union has woken up to the fact that it needs to be a little more credible in uh, putting Europe uh, whole and free and in one piece, as the Americans say, and uh, has added Ukraine and Moldova to the list of candidates and potentially Georgia. We are living under this horrible cloud of the Russian invasion and aggression uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but of course, other things do not go away. The U.S.-China uh, G2 world uh, competition, rivalry, uh, and, uh, and also some kind of cooperation on climate because both the U.S. and China are confronting the scourge of climate change and, and pollution. And then, of course, there is the whole issue of the geostrategic and geopolitical environment that has been put upside down with what Russia has done to the world order. Uh, Heather, after having been at the European Union, has led the Open Society European Policy Institute uh, for many years. She's still there um, and uh, has uh, done very much on looking at the big challenges that Europe faces both internally and externally. And we were just talking about the rule of law. Uh, but we won't be talking about that this evening. Uh, Heather, for her Year of Futures project, and we are live and live streamed now, uh, so around the globe people are watching us, uh, at least where there is daylight. I don't think <laughs> people are going to lose their sleep, but they can watch it afterwards, which is great. Um, it's one of the discoveries of COVID that you can actually have all of these things online and I'm sure that we are all benefiting from it. But tonight, the politics of the European Green Deal, um, and as I said, that is her project, but it's also how can uh, the whole issue of a Green Deal, uh, that's not only European, obviously, be also influential in issues like Ukraine, Moldova, obviously the Balkans, where I come from, and um, a discussion that is much broader, but again, uh, under the shadow of everything that's happened. So I'm sure we'll have a, a very exciting presentation. As you see, there will be a PowerPoint. And uh, then, as usual, uh, maybe I'll ask a question of or two, and then we'll open it up for a discussion. So Heather, wonderful to have you with us. And please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be back here um, at the Institute, uh, where I've had so many fascinating conversations, um, and to think about this very new um, set of issues. Um, but I would like to situate um, the issues of the politics of the European Green Deal and the politics of the climate transition um, in uh, a wider span 
um, because, after all, this is the Institute for Human Sciences. Um, and the wider span is about also democratic principles and principles of justice. And um, sitting here in the EVM library, one of my favorite places, with um, Wittgenstein on my left side and Rawls on my right side, um, I'm going to introduce some political philosophy, um, which was my first love at university. Um, and although I've worked most of my career on the European Union and European integration um, in terms of political science um, and particularly on and in policy, um, it's the issues raised by the green transition very much take us back to some fundamental concepts of political philosophy which need reinvention for a new generation and for a new set of issues. Um, and I think that there is some real help that political philosophers of the past can give us. So, the first thing to think about when it comes to how to maintain democratic uh, consent for the transition is that this raises fundamental challenges for representative democracy as we know it today, as it has evolved since the 19th century. Um, at the very heart of the democratic systems that we all know and cherish is the idea that leaders are elected by current constituents now within geographical boundaries, national boundaries, and they serve the interests of those people. They serve the interests of their electorate, their constituents, and to do anything else would be a betrayal of their mandate. Their mandate is to serve the interests of the people who have voted now. Not the people who voted for them, but all the people in that nation, um, uh, that, that uh, geographical unit now. But the problem with climate is, it transcends both of the temporal and the geographical boundaries um, that we're used to when it comes to representative democracy. Um, it's different in terms of time because it's going to affect future generations far more than it affects us. We have the prospect of people in the future living worse than our children and grandchildren living worse uh, than us, whereas we're used to um, essentially things getting better with each generation. So it really changes the temporal um, constraints. Uh, there's a mismatch. Um, and also, um, and, and of course, it, it goes beyond the familiar electoral cycle of changing government every four or five years. In fact, what you need to have a, a climate transition to be a success is very consistent policy over many changes of government, um, a decades-long transition. Um, so that's very difficult when you have an electoral choice to make um, every four or five years. And of course, when the voters don't necessarily know whether, um, often don't know at all, whether the choices they're making now will change outcomes for um, in 10 years or 20 years' time. It's, it's very difficult to tell that. Because this is the ultimate transnational cross-border issue. Um, it's, uh, I'm using climate in a very rough sense because uh, this isn't just about climate, of course. This is also about biodiversity, resource use, pollution, all kinds of environmental effects, all the things that have been excluded from economic models uh, for all these decades. But um, just in terms of emissions, literally just climate, um, the climate doesn't care who makes the emissions, um, whether they're made in Europe or in Africa, whether they're made in Germany or in France. And so for that reason, um, it's actually very difficult to have uh, a nation state deciding on a climate policy, voting for a climate policy, when that nation state, even the largest, one of the largest and most uh, richest, for example, Germany, Germany only accounts for 2% of global emissions. So what about the other 98%? Um, and so for that reason, there's also geographical mismatch. And this is really tricky. It's decades long, it's effects. Um, and in fact, um, there are those who argue uh, that, in fact, governments simply don't have a mandate to address climate because of those regions. reasons. There's a really good book that's just come out by a geographer, <laughs> François Germain, um, called Il n'a pas de consensus. Uh, no, was it? L'écologie n'est pas un consensus, in which he argues that, you know, fundamentally it's a betrayal of democratic principles for governments to go beyond their mandate and to think about voters and, uh, who haven't yet been born and voters in, in other countries, other parts of the world. However, the German Constitutional Court disagrees with him. Um, and they, the judges in Karlsruhe ruled in March 2021 that, in fact, the German government, based on the German constitution, 
does have responsibility uh, both for future generations and also for people outside Germany. It was very clear in a really landmark ruling that needs to be discussed more and we think will also um, set legal principles that other cases will draw on. Um, it said very clearly that uh, the German climate law has to be stronger to protect the interests and the freedoms. Uh, in fact, I think it's the, the health and lives of future Germans and that German foreign policy must try to influence the other 98% of emissions and not just Germany's own emissions. So this idea of unelected judges, which is uh, often uh, used as a criticism, they clearly have a very important role as well as elected politicians. Um, and we also see other attempts at uh, intergenerational um, uh, thinking and planning. For example, Norway, one of the largest fossil fuel producers, but also a, 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 you know, a, a democracy that cares about future generations and, uh, um, and equality, has set up a sovereign wealth fund uh, with which it's trying to fund reforestation elsewhere in the world. Um, so this kind of long-term thinking and wider thinking, it is there in some countries. But in many countries, including many members of the European Union, there's a real risk that backlash against the European Green Deal and against climate policies and objections to governments following the interests outside voters will cause voters uh, to reject their policies and cause very sudden swings against uh, policies like the European Green Deal, which can really hijack the whole process. Uh, it could be derailed in future years. And it's interesting how many experts on climate are starting to mutter things like, well, maybe authoritarian governments would be better. Uh, look at China, which has had a 20-year strategy on building up the supply chains for raw materials for its own decarbonization, which Europe has failed to do. Um, however, I think everybody who ever had any experience of the Soviet Union and other um, authoritarian regimes know that environmental outcomes were generally not better. So I think it's, it's a dubious argument that autocracies are necessarily better than democracies. They also have changes of policy, and they are also subject to the whims of leaders, um, but without the accountability. So how do we get the kind of long-term intergenerational planning and cross-boundary uh, transnational policies that are needed. Well, here's one potential solution. The European Union. Ha. So before going into all the reasons why the EU has uh, problems dealing with this issue, let's just think about why the EU actually does have some advantages in dealing with it. Well, one thing is it's actually really good at long-term policy frameworks. Um, the EU you know, had 10 years of planning and work um, to create the single European market. Uh, no national government could have done that. Um, it created, it's created the Schengen area of passport-free travel. It's launched a single currency. These were all the results of long-term planning. Um, and the European Green Deal is also an example of setting targets for 2050 and also the interim target of 2030. So the EU has the advantage among democratic political systems of having supranational institutions and longer policy cycles than national governments do. And uh, in fact, I think we've seen during COVID and also after the Russian invasion of Ukraine that a lot of parts of the European Green Deal, most of it has actually stood up fairly well. It's been more resilient than expected. Parts have definitely moved backwards. Agriculture is a good example of this. Um, but um, the uh, emissions reductions and, um, of course, the energy transition have, um, have continued. We can go into more detail on that. But on the whole, um, it, it's holding for the moment. But the big question is about democracy. Does the, European Green, De does the e European Green Deal have sufficient democratic legitimacy to undertake this scale of transition, a whole of society, whole of economy transition? So here I'd like to bring in political philosopher number one, Jürgen Habermas. Um, so he, uh, of course, wrote a great deal about transnational democracy and also about what it takes to, to uh, make democracy live, uh, a subject on which, by the way, Ivan Levoda wrote a very seminal paper with Mary Kaldor in the mid-1990s, which I recommend to you, all about um, the civic part of democracy and uh, looking as, as part of substantive democracy, not only procedural. And Habermas um, recognized in a seminal um, article in 2015 the problem of what he calls the growing discrepancy between world society that is becoming increasingly interdependent at the systemic level. And of course, that's only increased since 2015. Um, so that's on the one side, you've got this world society that's very interdependent and a world of states that remains fragmented 
and of course where the locus of democratic legitimacy lies. Um, and he points out that in Europe there's only a partial solution. Um, and he, he argues that the European Parliament should have a much bigger role, that's, that's the solution. I think anybody who's worked with and on the European Parliament also recognises the, the flaws in that, that system too. Um, and in fact, I think it's this fragile and constantly dynamic relationship between the EU institutions and the member states which, um, which is at the heart of this. Um, the European Green Deal is holding but the, the way that the EU's political system frequently results in lowest common denominator outcomes that are far from optimal is a real problem when you've got such an urgent set of measures that need to be taken. It's the urgency of the European Green Deal that makes this so difficult in a very slow-moving political system like the European <laughs> Union. So another time problem, another temporal problem. You can plan long term, but it's very hard to get rapid action in the short term. And the other problem with Habermas's solution is that transnational democracy has become less popular and less credible, not more. I mean, look at the, the conference on the future of Europe that ended this year, hasn't resulted in, in big picture um, outcomes, and multilateral institutions are losing legitimacy as nationalism is reviving with a lot of more great power rivalry. So it's very hard to replace the nation state as the primary unit of democratic representation, at least in terms of input legitimacy, even if um, in terms of climate, out output legitimacy is, is getting more attention um, from the public. So, transnational democratic structures, very hard to see them providing the answer. Even in the EU, where we have them, where they exist, uh, there is no equivalent of the European Parliament at global level. Um, but there is a lot of innovation going on, which I think offers more solutions, and which is at the heart of both of, of some of Habermas's con concepts of democracy and also those that Ivan Vedova wrote back in, Rafe Bivida wrote back in, in the 1990s about, which is going local and actually engaging civil society and individuals through deliberative democracy. Um, the growth of climate assemblies, panels, uh, citizens' panels, or sortition-led um, democratic exercises um, on climate issues across a range of countries. Think about Ireland and, and the outcome on peat uh, cutting, for example. There have also been many interesting, innovative um, experiments in, um, in local and, and in deliberative democracy in Spain, in Poland, in, uh, across the EU. This is, and, and of course in other countries too, New Zealand and Canada have both, have both looked at this a lot. This is very encouraging because this means not less democracy, but more and deeper democracy through local engagement. And it takes uh, within the nation state as well as beyond it. But it still creates a paradox at the heart of the EU's own capacity to deliver tangible results for its citizens, which is the EU as a political system tends to avoid having clear winners and losers. Um, and often credit for its successes is immediately taken by national politicians and by city mayors. The classic game after European councils in Brussels is for a leader to go out to the waiting press corps and say in his or her national language, well, of course, I fought hard for our interests and I'm glad to say that the result has, has served our country's interests, no matter what they said in the room and whether the outcome was in fact uh, the result of, of their success or their failure. And then, of course, when they don't like the outcome, they come out and complain complain and blame the European Union. So this is a game that it's great national politicians to play, but it saps the credibility of the overall project when you've got something as big and as whole of society and whole of, whole of economy as the European Green Deal. And of course, um, the problem that these large-scale policy ambitions in the European Green Deal, they operated on a time frame which is not only out of sync with national electoral cycles, but also with some of the EU's own cycles. For example, the seven-year um, budgetary cycle. So a good example of this is the way that um, the EU's plan to... Um, uh, reduce the emissions from agriculture and also the biodiversity and pollution problems from agriculture. Agriculture accounts for 30% of emissions, 70% of fresh water usage and a huge amount of, of pollution. Um, but that farm to fork strategy came out um, after the budget allocations had already been decided for seven years under the common agricultural policy. So there's still some temporal problems there as well.
Now, this matters a lot for whether we and our children and grandchildren actually manage to live on a habitable pl planet and whether we actually experience major climate impacts also in Europe. But it also has a further dimension, which is really about justice itself. So um, I'd really like to go into that now. Because climate justice is a quite a very interesting and new field. Um, and I think one of the critical things to remember about climate justice is it means many different things. And we here we can get some help from our friend Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, who, after all, reminded us oops, that... Sorry, let me start with Wittgenstein, then I'll go to the cartoon. It's better that way round. Es kommt das Fressen und dann die Morale. So, um, so Wittgenstein, of course, in his uh, philosophy of language, particularly his, the his private language argument, argues very much that um, language is made by a linguistic community. The meaning of a word is not determined by what you remember it, me it means. It's determined by how it's used by the participants in your linguistic community. And it takes a, it takes a community, it takes a village to, um, to, to forge the meaning of a word. And of course, that means it evolves and it changes. And there are many different dimensions of climate justice that, um, where th that we need to take into account because it's used in many different ways. Um, so it's used in terms of north-south justice. What we've just seen at the, at the COP uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, COP27 this year, was a big focus on loss and damage as north-south, global north, global south, climate justice. Um, and this issue of um, those who put up most of the emissions that are currently in the stock in the atmosphere should be paying more for the adaptation of those who are most threatened immediately by it, particularly, for example, low-lying states, which will literally, their territory will disappear. Um, and, of course, those in the global south um, who are suffering already um, from major desertification and other problems. Um, that's, that's one really important area of justice. But there are also others. There's also social justice within societies. What happens in terms of the poorest within European societies? Uh, the EU set up the European Social Fund, um, the, the, there's the, the Just Transition Fund, um, and there are social funds uh, to try to, to cope with that. But is this mainly about redistribution? And those funds, by the way, at EU level are on a very small scale. Or is it also about opening new opportunities in the economy um, and dealing with um, both uh, the uh, problems of making the transition, um, at, but also um, ensuring that, again, future generations um, have um, the freedoms um, in our society. That, that's also part of social justice. Um, so this question, and I, I think here, um, it's actually really important to think about the experience of 1989. So post-communist transition paid very little attention to social justice famously. Um, the neoliberalism was all the rage um, in 1989. It was maybe coming to its peak in 1991. And um, the, consensus, the Washington consensus that then prevailed uh, was all about making the transition happen as, as soon as possible. And the social justice outcomes were largely ignored. I mean, think about just as a... Um, uh, a, an indication of this, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development issued transition indicators over many years, and they never even covered inequality um, in, in terms of their reports um, until uh, 2017. Inequality in as a, as, as a significant issue. Um, and then gender had to come in after that. Um, so the losers from transition Yes, some of them were able to be vocal and active and got paid off, um, particularly those who are well-organized, particularly in labor groups. So coal miners, for example, did better. And I think that coal miners will actually do quite well in terms of getting redistribution, re redistributed money in this transition. Whereas the losers who are much more diffuse, who are spread out across society, who are less evident, who are less vocal, and especially those who suffer later in the transition, they tend to get ignored. And we saw that in 1989. But another very important lesson from 1989 and a big difference from, um, from what's going to happen with the climate transition um, is that the former system was largely discredited. There was very little sense. Uh, just occasionally it was there in some countries and from some political voices. But on the whole, nobody expected it was possible to return to 
the status quo ante. Nobody expected it was possible to go back to the old regime. Whereas at the moment, people can cling to the status quo and the current regime for a very long time. There are entrenched interests. It hasn't been discredited. And in fact, some of the main beneficiaries of it, um, think about fossil fuel companies, for example, and in fact, all of us who own cars, houses with gas-fired uh, boilers, um, and so on, have a stake in the existing economy. So it's much harder to move to something radically different. And, of course, the difference with 1989 was that there was um, a living, breathing model of a different kind of economy that you could point to. You can say, hey, you know, the future's bright. You can live like people do in Western Germany. You're going to have levels of prosperity like in But that was a very powerful promise. Um, and it was possible to show how the future economy might look on television screens, because there it was. You could peep over the Berlin Wall and see it. We don't have an example of real existing um, uh, low carbon at the moment. We don't have a real existing climate neutral economy to point to. Um, Kate Rayworth, who the famous author of Donut Economics, has done some very interesting um, uh, modeling of, of which economies are getting closest to it. Costa Rica does pretty well at both meeting human needs uh, while staying within planetary boundaries, but there are hardly any economies that are within the donut limits at the moment. So that's that kind of, those sorts of justice outcomes for the public are very difficult to guarantee. It's very hard to say to people um, what it's going to be like um, in the, the future economy. Um, and that leads us to an issue that I think John Rawls over here can help us with, um, which is ma in making policy on climate and for um, a, a carbon neutral and indeed a climate neutral economy of the future, his veil of ignorance, a fundamental concept in his theory of justice, um, is, is a very important one. Not only because it's a, an important theoretical concept and essentially what it says... And also the fact that coal is simply so big and unfortunately coming back now in Europe with, with the energy transition crisis that, that Russia has... Give, give us a few thoughts on, on that. Mm. Give, give us a few thoughts on, on that. Mm. Well, the Chinese leadership doesn't face the same democratic constraints, um, being a one-party state, but it does have to deliver for its people to stay in power. And so the output legitimacy uh, for the Communist Party is big. Um, and there are strong domestic reasons for China to undertake um, major changes to its economy, to green its economy. One of them is, of course, the amount of pollution in China itself, um, air pollution, obviously, but also agricultural, you know, all of the problems that, they, that they've had with producing um, clean food and, and, and with water, especially, uh, desertification and so on. So the, um, the massive effect of, um, of industrialization and, ma and very rapid growth on, on China's own um, ecology um, is driving it. But also that climate change is not good for China's economy either. Um, they are suffering the impact of climate change too. So I think there's, there's that. Um, and so the dilemma uh, for the, the, the leadership in China, as in many countries of the world, is how do you continue, how do you make a change to a more sustainable system uh, which then delivers results for your people over time while satisfying them in the short term with jobs and growth? Um, and so hence, continuing to burn coal, continue and actually building nuclear power plants, which don't uh, have the emissions, but have other problems with waste and so on. Um, they are also trying to find their own, their own way. But, but China is, of course, also building renewables at an extremely rapid rate. And I think one of the big questions is um, the competition for decarbonization technology, because um, China's own renewables build out domestically uh, means that they are going to use a lot of the supplies of renewables raw materials and process materials, which they basically control. I mean, 95% of the world's uh, raw materials for renewables technology is already controlled by China. If they need a lot more of that domestically, there will be less available to supply to, for example, Europe for our decarbonization and to the United States. So this issue is of shortages of solar panels and of batteries and both of the raw materials and the finished products is a very serious one. And so what is Europe doing about that? Uh, well, there's a big debate about that. There's this thing called the raw materials, the Critical Raw Materials Act, which is being um, 
being put forward. So I, I think the question is how to cooperate with China on all of these things. And, and so the idea of G2 rivalry with the US makes many Europeans quite queasy um, yep. because of the because you know the DNA of 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 um, European politicians tends to be more about cooperation <laughs> rather than competition and because we don't have a, a chance of competing with China in the way that maybe the US might think it does um, so there's a geopolitical dimension to this but there's also really a practical dimension okay let's open it up to comments and questions thoughts Kirsty Oh, sorry, do use the microphone and do introduce yourself. Um, um, Kirsty Lang. Um, what about the role of, of cities in this? Because isn't it the case that cities are often far more progressive on the issue of climate change than nation states? Absolutely, and they're also more active on democratic engagement in many cases. So cities have done some of the biggest innovations. Uh, think about Barcelona's superblocks, for example, greening the city and excluding traffic from large areas of it. Uh, you, they're, they're some of the most interesting um, conferences about climate are conferences of mayors, where they talk about, OK, how do we deal with mobility and housing and waste? Um, partly because cities are where human populations are concentrated, so that's where many of the, the issues about environmental impact um, Im from emissions through to waste um, uh, come through, um, but also there where mayors actually have to talk to people about both the impact of climate and, and other environmental problems now, but also uh, where they have to try and sell the transition as they deal with uh, problems that are happening now as well as those for the future. So um, there have been really interesting um, experiments at city level, both with uh, having democratic input, um, climate assemblies at city level, for example, but also participatory budgeting. So um, making parts of the city budget subject to uh, decisions by citizens. Uh, Brussels is trying this. Paris did this on a on larger scale. Um, there, are, there are a lot of interesting things. And, of course, cities are now undertaking some of the most radical measures. Uh, there was a huge outcry when Amsterdam announced that it would just not allow internal combustion engines into Amsterdam. Uh, I think it was by 2030, which is really early. Now the EU is talking about doing that for, 20, tw for everybody by 2035, just phasing out them out completely in, in terms of new sales. So, um, it, and, and cities tend to learn from one another and copy. Mayors like to copy one another because they see whether it works. So I think in terms of experimentation, there are a lot of bright spots there. Um, and at the same time, cities are where some of the worst environmental degradation has happened. So um, I think there's an interesting question as to whether the megacities like Jakarta or um, Sao Paulo will be able to deal with uh, climate on such a large scale, uh, climate change on such a large scale. Um, and um, the ways that, I mean, they, they have populations the size of entire countries. Um, and so I think finding solutions there could be really important in terms of providing the models of the future I was mentioning. The model of a carbon neutral and a climate neutral economy might be provided first at city level rather than country level. Yeah, if I can just add, uh, great, great question, by the way, Christy. And uh, when I was at the German Marshall Fund, we had an urban program putting American and European cities together exactly along these lines. So much mutual learning was happening um, on, on a whole variety of issues. But uh, climate, and we saw that even before the, the Trump presidency, it was cities that were really driving the, the climate agenda. Uh, and pushing very radically as opposed to state governments or the federal government, California in particular, of course. And, and in fact, this is a really important point you're raising, Ivan, that um, they kind of resisted Trump's rollback. Um, at federal level, Trump rolled back on uh, all kinds of environmental protection and um, the transition in general, and California pushed ahead. And even Texas pushing ahead with building wind, for example. Um, and I think it would be harder for a, a Trump-like president coming in later to push back precisely because of that. Because, in fact, they're, they're experiencing the environmental degradation, the lack of water, the problems with pollution, um, and also because people have got... They get used to a new reality. Absolutely. Okay. Back there. I can't see you, actually, but I saw your hand. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Um, I wanted to make a comment and also to ask uh, a question. 
So uh, my comment is about China, uh, because I've lived in China for most of the century, and it seems to me that China is very far ahead in terms of some of the um, climate issues. So it's ahead in terms of the renewables and EVs and wind power and wave power and, and these kinds of things. And it's unfortunate that they have to use coal temporarily, but I think they're still on track to meet their uh, 2030 and 2060 goals. Um, I was interested in the comment that you made about uh, uh, ombudsmen, and I think it's a wonderful idea, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. In, in the law, we have this concept of guardian ad litem for children, so the best interests of children could be represented, and it seems to me we have this generational divide between uh, young people and uh, older people, and uh, young people aren't well represented, maybe even unborn people are not represented. So I think this idea of an institutionalized representative for younger people is wonderful. So tell us more about it, and is that idea going anywhere? Thanks very much. There are some experiments in this. Lisbon, for example, another city uh, example. Um, the city of Lisbon um, is experimenting with new policy tools to include um, an assessment of inner intergenerational impact um, for uh, new proposals. Um, so, you know, and, and they've been working with an NGO that has, has set up a whole kind of policy toolbox um, at city level um, to assess whether a policy, you know, what kind of impact will it have. Um, and I think a big question is where, how many generations forward do you look? Uh, do you look, I mean, 2030 is not a next generation, that's like really soon. Um, but do you look to 2050? Do you look to 2070? Do you look to 2100? Um, you know, my children may well still be alive in 2100, actually. And so whether or not they're in a world of two and a half degrees or four degrees will be hugely important um, uh, to them, and therefore it's important to me. So um, I think this, once this becomes more of a, a kind of standard um, thing that you need to think about when you're proposing new policies, I think this is really beneficial for democracy, actually. It's important for climate, but it also just changes the time frame. It forces us all to think beyond consume, consume, consume now. Um, it takes us back, actually, to notions which are there previously in our own cultural history in Europe, but also which you see very much in indigenous communities and in most of uh, the world's great spiritual traditions, which is thinking in terms of several generations, both of the ancestors, but also of the descendants. And the idea of being a good ancestor, that we need to think of ourselves as being a good ancestor, and what does that mean? And using <laughs> concepts like um, thinking of the impact on the seventh generation, as some indigenous communities do. This is, um, I think, a fantastic antidote to fast food, fast fashion, um, and um, instant gratification, which is so much part of you know, the capitalist culture that we now live in. It's a really interesting way of extending our own time horizons as human beings. We're not just thinking about um, even our own health, uh, for example, and well-being over, over the years to come, but those of those who come um, after us. Um, and I think, frankly, it's probably going to it would deliver a, a better society and maybe better mental health for all of us to think in those terms. So I think this is super interesting. Plus, your point about generations, um, that the great thing about intergenerational justice is we actually have different generations who can talk to one another already, can debate. Um, and uh, it's perhaps uh, the grandchildren talking to the grandparents that might lead to shifts in, in mental maps and, uh, and in individual behavior. Yes, please. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on concepts such as degrowth or post-growth economics to address um, the sustainability predicament? So this is a, uh, there's a huge literature on this and uh, degrowth is, is another um, concept that is rapidly evolving. There's a, there's a lot of change. Um, so I think that the fundamental thing to look at is um, what do we mean by growth? How do we measure it? And secondly, um, what causes it? So one thing is um, GDP growth, which is the most commonly used measure and the one that you see in all the headlines and so on. Um, 
this is a fundamentally flawed concept, I think, because GDP does not measure the right things. Um, it's a basket of goods. It's a, it's a, it's a measure that was set up um, for um, industrializing economies um, and which does not include uh, well-being um, and many of the outcomes that we might want for society. Ah, I've just remembered Rawls's last uh, principle in the Veil of Ignorance, which is um, that the people who write the new rules uh, or create the new system of justice should also be ignorant of what counts as the good life. Now, GDP measures were set up with a, a concept of the good life, which was mainly about um, economic activity based on consumption. Now, you can change those measures. Uh, the OECD has done some really interesting work on um, well-being indicators and replacing GDP with well-being. But this is, there's not yet a consensus view that, that creates an alternative. There are alternatives to GDP out there, but they're, they're not fundamentally, they're, they're not there yet. But I think a lot of degrowth is about GDP being an, an inaccurate measure of um, social outcomes, well-being outcomes, you know, outcomes in terms of meeting human needs. I think what Kate Rayworth has done in terms of um, using the sustainable development goals as a way of thinking about how we meet human needs is much more helpful. So that would be one part of the debate that I think is hugely constructive and which then doesn't lead us down an alley of uh, does this mean there will never be any more growth? Yeah, there may not be the kind of GDP growth we've seen in the past, which for Europe and for the United States we're not in Europe, certainly, we're not achieving very much GDP growth anymore either. And it doesn't bring much more, more prosperity, um, but it does have huge environmental impact. Um, but then the other way of thinking about it that I think is very important is, um, is can we have growth in the economy without consuming more resources? So we are hugely inefficient in how we use resources. Um, I just point you to the, um, the global resource outlook produced by the UN Environment Programme's International Resource Panel, which has some horrifying um, statistics. You know, since the 1970s, GDP, GDP has quadrupled globally. Our use of fresh water has become enormously more, and yet our resource efficiency has not grown. We just use, we consume more and more and more and more and more resources, and of course the population is growing. Um, and in fact, they predict that um, the resources we're using now, which are already three planets worth of resources, that would double by 2060, right? So Switzerland, for example, or Belgium, where I live, uh, is already using nearly three planets worth of resources to sustain our current economy. Um, and by 2060, we'd be using six planets worth. This is clearly can't continue. So resource efficiency, which means moving to a circular economy, using fewer raw materials, uh, being able to reuse and um, recycle a lot more, and designing products so they last longer, so you don't just buy new ones, throw them away and buy new ones. This really matters um, in terms of environmental impact. So you can have an increase in parts of the economy um, without necessarily increasing resource use. And I think that's the fundamental thing. How do you decouple growth from resource use? Tim Jackson is an economist who's pointed out that um, there are very um, low environmental impact activities that could grow enormously. Culture, for example. Um, so, you know, art galleries, museums, um, uh, music festivals. These have relatively low environmental impact. They have some, but much less than many other activities like shopping, um, <laughs> which we also is also a leisure activity, right? Um, you can have an increase in uh, also, for example, uh, things like massage and other yoga and well-being activities, okay? These have pretty low environmental impact. Um, and um, you could think about um, changing the tax system so that labor-intensive activities cost less and resource in intensive activities cost more. So I think this is where the, the, the debate needs to go. It shouldn't just be about, oh, we need to target minus 5% growth. That can, that's very sterile, but there are a lot of really interesting areas to go into. So let me ask you a question that you brought up in September while we were here in discussions and uh, thinking about Ukraine and its reconstruction. And you mentioned that green policy and input could be a good way of how one links now Ukraine as a candidate to the EU before it becomes a member, but actually drawing it in to these bigger uh, policy uh, mm. directions. Well, I think there's a lot we can learn from Ukraine, frankly, um, in this, these very dark days of power outages and, and everything else. 
Uh, it's important to remember how extraordinarily resilient the Ukrainian his economy has been, partly because it's so decentralized. So the fact that the Ukrainian state has not, over the past um, <coughs> several decades, um, uh, moved to uh, an extremely centralized system that uh, provides lots of central services and goods. Right? There are plenty of reasons to criticize that. But, but it has led to this outcome that Ukrainians are very self-reliant. Lots of goods and services are provided locally. Um, communities work together um, in order to, to keep um, for example, food um, on the table. Um, most of, uh, a great deal of, of Ukrainian agriculture is in fact small and medium-sized farms. They, they employ 70% of the agricultural workers in Ukraine and they supply 90% um, of the um, labor intensive um, things like potatoes and vegetables, which are keeping people going. Um, so uh, having that kind of economy, a much more decentralized, um, self-reliant, local, locally based um, for, for many things. I mean, not, not obviously for power, and that's one of the big problems. The fact that power is centralized is why it was so easy for Russia to knock out um, the, the power supply to much of the population. If, they, if Ukraine had had the energy transition before and not been reliant on essentially a Soviet-era system, which is still, still operating, it would have been much harder for Russia to do that. Um, so this is, and this is why it would be so important for Ukraine Ukraine now to be integrated into the European Green Deal. So already back in March, amazingly, very shortly after the invasion, in incredibly difficult cir circumstances, both Ukraine and Moldova synchronized their electricity grids with the European grid, which means it's possible to send electricity into Moldova and Ukraine from the European grid. This is really fortunate. But of course, now many of the substations have been destroyed um, and there are shortages of, of um, transformers and things that are needed um, uh, to rebuild it. Um, so this is this is a uh, this is really problematic, but on energy you can see that um, synchronization with Europe and moving into uh, the the Green Deal in terms of rebuilding with renewables rather than rebuilding um, with with Russian gas um, uh, is is the way to go. But on food systems, I think Ukraine has lessons to teach the EU. Um, and the last thing we should transfer from Europe is the common agricultural policy <laughs> with its, you know, monocultures and its high level of, of uh, state subsidy to um, very intensive and highly polluting agriculture with lot very intensive inputs like pesticides and fertilizer and so on. This is not the way to go. Um, so, um, in fact, helping Ukraine to m move to largely organic farming would both meet local needs better but also provide... Um, lower environmental impact products um, into, into other markets, including the EU. So that would be another thing to do. And of course, um, Ukraine has um, advantages, like for example, uh, availability of iron ore, which may have made um, steel a very important industry. Now, Ukraine's largest emitter currently lies in ruins. It's the Mariupol steel works. So the obvious thing to do now is to rebuild uh, steel in Ukraine to take advantage of the iron ore, but to do it with um, state-of-the-art uh, electric arc um, direct um, reduction furnace so that Ukraine can start producing green steel. Now, we need to use less steel to have a, a, a less resource-intensive economy, but we also need to be using green steel where steel is still necessary. And Ukraine being able to provide that would be a real boon for uh, the European economy, and it would provide jobs in an industry where Ukraine has fantastic skills and where people could be employed again, particularly, we hope, at some point, um, soldiers who are no longer needed on the front line. So I think there are all kinds of ways in which the EU... Um, could think about a green Ukraine as being an integral part of the European Green Deal. And the absolutely fundamental condition for that happening is financing, uh, which the EU has also uh, is really struggling to find, um, uh, even just to keep the current state budget uh, propped up in Ukraine. So making um, the European Green Deal funding available to Ukraine, as it is to the member states, would be an advantage. So I advocate green membership for Ukraine. <laughs> there you go. Questions, comments? Rafael. Um, once again, thank you for your talk and a lot of thoughts that you provided us with to think further. Um, we've mentioned yesterday there was um, a lecture 
And I mentioned my actual nightmare. I don't know what is real and what is realistic about that, and that's why I would like to ask you about this kind of fantasy that I have. So on the one hand, we have China, which, uh, let's say, let's predict that it could be efficient in delivering a green policies. And on the other hand, we have an institution called Vatican, which after, uh, from what I see after the, uh, it's the revealing of its sexual crimes, tends to make a rebranding by becoming a leader, a spiritual leader of you know, ecological movements and so on. So can we predict that in the scenario that China is successful and is going to have a deal with Vatican that I did they are just negotiating to legitimize Catholicism in China, we will end up, if we as the West would be unsuccessful on this road, we will end up with those both superpowers, one you know, as a potestas and another as a auctoritas that would uh, just outsmart us. Well, <laughs> indeed, this is thinking outside the box, as is appropriate for the EVM. Um, <laughs> so I think what unites those two, um, shall we say, um, political forces, because they are both political forces as well as having, um, one has a geographical dimension, the other one has its, its spiritual constituency. Geographical constituency, spiritual constituency, we could say, is in fact this, this issue of timing, of thinking in longer, in longer timelines and deriving their legitimacy for their constituents, shall we say, um, from providing um, the idea of very long-term security. Now, I'm neither Chinese nor Catholic, nor an expert on either. Um, however, it seems to me that the way that um, Pope Francis, um, in his encyclical on climate and ecology, really talked a great deal about future generations and the need to look after um, the planet as something given to humans by God, and um, in his frame of reference, that also includes then the future humans, um, and so on. Th this, that's real leadership in getting people to think about um, more than just their current interests today. So it's really valuable that he did that. Um, and whether you um, are a, you know, a believer in Catholicism or not, that kind of leadership, I think, is very is laudatory because it um, gives... It, it just takes us out of our fear. I mean, I think this, you know, it, we, this, is kind of, this is kind of a joke and it's kind of really serious because the human brain tends to focus on the here and now when it feels under threat. I mean, the neuroscientists talk about the way that the amygdala, the, the fight or flight reptile brain, takes over when we're seeing this wave. We're terrified by this wave, this little wave in front of us now. We can't even think about waves to come. So providing that longer time frame and lifting us out of um, the, our, our, our you know, current quite large concerns is hugely valuable. Um, the Chinese leadership is also, um, you know, the, a key part of its output legitimacy is maintaining stability. Um, this is enormously important because of Chinese history, particularly in the 20th century, uh, that it derives a great deal of legitimacy um, from offering people guarantees that we're going to provide stability and um, security in society. Now, we can, I, you, we can definitely argue about whether they're actually providing that, uh, especially now with the, the, the lockdowns and, and so on. Um, but by that, again, that sort of longer term perspective, um, this is very different from the um, instant gratification, constant scrolling, uh, attention deficit disorder culture that we're living in here. Um, and it's not that, that either, either the Catholic Church or China can provide answers on climate, but um, I think it's what's really important is to consider that this is going to be the issue that dominates our lives, our lives, the people in this room here, um, because it's going to get bigger and, and more intense. Um, and we need to find ways of dealing with it emotionally, mentally, spiritually, as well as in terms of economics and politics. And so whoever can chip in on that and offer solutions, I think it's, it's really important to make those kinds of contributions. There are also contributions of art, of culture, um, as well as of political science and economics. Um, and 
having that, you know, in, in terms of our, it's not just about our existence as humans on the planet. I'm not so worried about the planet. The planet has survived mass extinctions before. The planet Earth will still be going around the sun for a really long time. But we as humans need to think about how we want to live um, for our remaining days here, as well as how our children live. And in that, this is a much bigger thing, um, even than democracy. Indeed, the planet will be around without us <laughs> very merrily. <laughs> Let me then, um, well, I have several <laughs> questions, but um, th there's been a big debate, obviously, about critical raw materials. It's one of the uh, main topics that's swirling around. And there's also been analyses about what it actually means to go to electrical vehicles. And some have said that actually the environmental impact is bigger by <laughs> creating <laughs> batteries based on these critical raw materials and that in fact we won't be achieving the result that we want because of that impact that we can't really calculate at, at this moment. Where, where do you see these debates? Because we're obviously going towards electrical um, vehicles, mm. you know, let, let alone the question do we need vehicles and why don't we all kind of use public transport to put it very simply. Another thing. Yeah, I, I think this is about the mental shift. Um, the mental shift we have to make from um, owning things to using things. Um, from everything as a good to everything as a service. Um, because we can't replace every single internal combustion engine car, what, like for like, one for one, with an electric vehicle. There aren't enough minerals in the crust of the earth, even if we dig up all the remaining forests and start mining in cities, urban mining, this is a new concept which, is, which has come along. Um, it's true. It's also true, by the way, that, however, that electric vehicles are just fantastically better than internal combustion engines. So don't ever believe the disinformation which is going around from the fossil fuel lobby that you, you, you shouldn't replace your fossil fuel car. Yes, you should. But you don't necessarily replace it with an electric vehicle that you own only for you. Because, in fact, um, there are lots of other ways we can achieve mobility. What we need, we don't need to own cars, we need mobility. We don't need to own refrigerators, we need cooling services. We don't need necessarily need to own houses. We need to have um, affordable and, um, and comfortable shelter. So uh, this is a fundamental shift in, in economic thinking, um, which I've been working on with... Um, Yanis Potochnik of the International Resource Panel and Systemic, and we produced a report called the International System Change Compass. So anybody who wants to look at everything as a service, uh, that's where to look for it, International System Change Compass. Um, but it's fundamentally, we need to think about this as um, not replacing everything that we currently have our, in our economy, like for like, with a low or no carbon version of it. Because an awful lot of what we have is really inefficient. It's extremely inefficient to have one car per person, even one car per household is very inefficient. And we already have the problems of congestion and parking and all the other problems. This, I mean, cities, one of the reasons why cities are moving to getting rid of um, internal combustion engines is not only pollution, it's just that it's not feasible to have cars in the city uh, on the kind of scale that we have anyway. But there are plenty of other solutions. So yes, buses, trams, Vienna is a fantastic example of, of really well integrated public transport networks at a very affordable price. It's, it's great. But there are lots of other things you could do. There's car shares. You know, why own one car when you might need um, a van tomorrow to move your, your stuff? You might need, uh, might feel like driving a sports car the following day because you're just going to do a little jaunt to the countryside. And you might need a family car on the, on the third day. You have shared cars. Uh, lots of these things work. And often you don't need a car at all because you can use a scooter, you can use an, use an electric bike, etc. So we need to think about these as integrated systems serving human needs rather than products where you just have then your, your um, low carbon alternative product. Um, and then when it comes to the critical raw materials, we do just need to use less of them as well as, um, yes, there, there does need to be in the short term more, um, more supply of these materials uh, because we have to build the low carbon technologies. But once they're there, then, it, unlike with fossil fuels, we won't go on 
importing them forever. With fossil fuels, you have to keep importing them forever. Whereas, at some point, you have enough renewables to supply the energy you need, you have enough vehicles. And in fact, I mean, there are already estimates about um, how many electric vehicles you need in the economy, um, basically, to have enough um, uh, reusable materials that you simply you don't need to import anymore. So don't believe the, uh, the disinformation about electric uh, batteries, but think about whether you need another car. No, clearly, I mean, decarbonization is, is the name of the game, and uh, there are various ways of going about it, and electrifying transport is, is one of the ways to do it. And one of my big kind of uh, pet frustrations is uh, I drive relatively often from Vienna via Budapest to Belgrade. It's a six-hour drive, and when you drive the part from Vienna to Budapest, you're driving constantly in the left lane because the right lane is a train of trucks, literally. Back-to-back -back trucks, so it's about 240 kilometers of trucks, and you're wondering why is that not on the railroad which is going along basically the, the highway. And I think that in that regard, not enough is being done. I mean, th there's been these statistics, for example, on high-speed rail. Obviously, China has humongously more than anyone else. I was surprised to see that Spain is the number two country after China, and then France, and then, then Italy, and the US is nowhere to be seen. I mean, th these are things that baffle you completely it's all about public investment. No, exactly. So yeah. that's what you're right to say. It's about the mindset. You know, do I really want to give up that car of mine or my three cars in <laughs> the American or other cases? Um, and is there an alternative? Is there all I and it has to be efficient and affordable and uh, handy so that you don't have to go five blocks away, but, you know, be on, on the corner. And I, I used shared cars when, when I was in Washington. It, it was handy, but um, the fact that America is particularly dramatic because they there it's mostly one person per car, and you have those dedicated lanes to people who actually have two people <laughs> in the car, which is sort of when you come for the first time, you say, what, what is this? Do I understand what it's about? And then you do understand. Yeah. But, but these are choices that were made. I mean, it's not like we, we've fallen into fossil fuels entirely by accident. You Indeed. know, Los Angeles had, um, early in the 20th century, a well-functioning tram system, yes. which was run out of business by a cartel of the rubber manufacturers, the oil barons, um, and the car makers, who said, oh, no, 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 we don't want that. We want people to buy cars. And the United States has consistently underinvested in rail and overinvested in roads. Um, when you look at other countries that have invested a great deal more in high-speed rail, uh, Japan, for example, Spain and, and France, as you mentioned as well, um, you, you don't, that pays off over time. But again, it requires long-term planning, and it also requires politics not to be so influenced by um, the fossil fuel industry. Um, we've, this has been consistently there for more than a century. Is it possible for us to move away from that? Well, we're doing it very rapidly from Russian gas, for example, um, but uh, we're still very far from stopping subsidies to fossil fuels. Which is proof that it can be done when push comes to shove. Emiliano. Emiliano Alessandro, former colleague of Ivan. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's a comment or a question. I, I would go back to the, um, to the title of your presentation, which is the politics of creating a resilient and green Europe. And I think we, you know, we touched upon very interesting aspects of what may happen going forward. We haven't talked enough about the politics. And, and by politics, I mean not only the politics among nations, but what is going to happen within our political systems and political communities as a result of the challenge. And, and I was thinking, you know, yes, we commented about the fact that climate change is the transnational issue by definition, uh, that it's an intergenerational uh, challenge. So, you know, there are a lot of parameters that force us to think beyond, you know, the, the units we normally have in mind, which is the nation state and the political cycles we're used to. 
But I'm also seeing, you know, if I, if I look into the future, the attempt, not only, you know, the attempt of the sort of wealthy classes, of the ruling classes, in a situation that is going to be uh, challenging for all, to carve out, you know, a system of, that protects them from, from some of the challenges of climate change. And we have seen that already with COVID, with other phenomena, right? That mm -hmm. those who have a job that allows them to work from home, those who can still find, whereas the masses are faced with, you know, the brutal reality of, of the challenge, those who have the education, the wealth, the means, the power, they carve out the space for them. So do you see that happening going forward and, and, and posing a, a threat to democracy, not because people don't, you know, the average citizen don't, doesn't buy into the Green Deal because he thinks it's, you know, too costly, but because actually the elites, in a way, will build, you know, sort of fortresses in their own countries. They will choose the best places. They will move to the places that are least affected. They will have the best technologies, you know, and, and we will be in very divided societies, even in the West, similar to less developed countries now, where you have visible differences between, you know, those who are exposed to everything that doesn't work in that country and those who are managing to sort of shield themselves from, again, I don't know if it was a question or a comment. <laughs> There's a huge, um, not just risk, but uh, predictable tendency. Those who have resources grab more resources to protect the resources they already have. Um, that tends to happen in any crisis, any kind of emergency, and this one is no different. And the most horrible outcome we would have is something I've heard re referred to as the armed lifeboat. You know, those who get in the li those who can afford it get into the lifeboat, and then they basically shoot at others who are trying to get on board. Um, so this is and the idea of kind of gated communities who can protect themselves from the impact of climate. This is a horrendous idea. That's why it's so important to get the justice part of it right now, while we still can. While the veil of ignorance is there. I mean, the veil of ignorance is in some ways helpful. For sure, um, a poor person in Africa has fewer resources to protect themselves than a wealthy American or European already. But there are, beyond that, you know, but there are also many dimensions of the, <coughs> that are unpredictable and uncertain at this point. And stressing how much we are in this together and the need for solidarity between generations, between continents, between peoples is really fundamentally needed. Um, it's, it's, a t it's terrible timing that we're at the moment in a, uh, an era where multinational, uh, multilateral institutions have, are weaker, where nationalism is stronger than it has been um, in, in recent decades, um, and when um, there's a, there's a, we've just had a pandemic. You know, it's, it's not good circumstances, but it's better than many others have been in history. So this, um, this, build, this establishing principles and trying to build solidarity is something that is vital to do in parallel with actually making the transition happen. Because if we just ended up with um, beautiful, cr green, clean cities in Europe, and maybe in the United States, in an even dirtier world with even more depletion of, of nature and grabbing of resources in the rest of the world, we're all still going to fry. We're just going to have, you know, climate change is still happening. It's going to be ghastly. Um, and instead, there will be millions of refugees um, from these parts of the world that, that are suffering. So this, this need to build justice into the transition is absolutely essential for it to succeed. Because just during the transition, um, where you get a few green, clean islands and everybody else is going to hell, this does not work. This simply doesn't work, not, certainly not in, in, in an interdependent world um, with mass media, where everybody knows where those gated communities are. That might, the city on the hill might have worked in an era when people were not aware of how others were living elsewhere in the world. It doesn't work now when mobility is there. And social media. So you can sit anywhere on the planet and see how the people on the hill live and enjoy goodies. And, and you have Google Maps telling you how to get there. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Christy. Well, I was just going to say, I was, I was just gonna say on, 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 on that point, um, I was reminded of this film that I think was made in about 2015 called Elysium, which is set in, it's this dystopian film that's set in sort of, it's made by a South African director and it's got Matt Damon in it. 
and um, uh, it, it, it imagines, you know, a, a planet Earth is destroyed by climate change, and the rich have have created some kind of, you know, green space station in the sky where you, the very rich can live. And and, uh, 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 and and actually, if you if this came out a few years ago, but since then, if you look at some of the ideas of, say, somebody like Peter Thiel, talking about building these 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 places in the middle of the Pacific or in space or whatever. I mean, <laughs> some of these Silicon Valley tech people really are thinking about that. It's not not so far off. Absolutely, yeah. Anyone else? I cannot not bring up um, Greta Thunberg uh, as an epitome of the youth and the future and the Fridays for future. Um, and that's the whole generational, intergenerational thing. Clearly, we cannot resolve this without having the intergenerational dialogue. And maybe because there are no further comments and questions. Are we beyond blah, blah, blah? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love the way that Greta Thunberg has both the wit and the courage to, uh, to point out the uncomfortable truth in the room. Yeah. And <laughs> we are it's still very much in the blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's horrifying how, I mean, at Sharm el-Sheikh, how little happened on um, real action. Uh, by governments to phase out fossil fuels, to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, um, to uh, make progress on many of the commitments they've even, just the ones they've made in previous years, let alone all that needs to happen now. No, we're still very much in the world of blah, blah, blah. And in fact, the greenwashing that's going on um, and is, is, a, is a fundamental problem. But I think the EU could help with this. Um, the, because what the EU is really good at, there are many things it's extremely bad at, but one of the things it's really good at is setting standards, um, setting metrics. That's what it's done with the single market program, for example. Um, and uh, I think that, and, and we, even with GDPR, you know, start starting to set standards for, for the online world um, is, uh, is another uh, important EU project. Um, and so the EU um, defining what counts as green in many areas, what counts as Paris compliant, could be a very important way to get through the blah, blah, blah. Now, the democratic process has not delivered fantastic results so far because you look at the taxonomy, for example, where both gas and nuclear are classified as yeah. green. This is not great. Um, far from it. Um, it's also uh, not good the way that there's been a lot of fudging of certain standards. But some of the fundamentals that the EU, where the EU has the power to act, um, and by the EU, I'm not talking about some government in the sky. The EU is, in fact, just a, is a giant compromise-making machine between um, elected representatives in the European Parliament, between um, all of the governments of the EU, and then, of course, um, uh, the Commission um, uh, proposing uh, legislation and, and initiatives like this. But what, what the EU has is the, is the possibility to set standards that really make new markets, to set the standards for what counts as green steel, to set the standards for, for, for example, the new electric vehicles and, and what kind of components they have. Things like the right to repair. Look at what Apple announced today, that it's going to preempt um, the EU's new legislation coming on right to repair by providing manuals and spare parts for anybody anywhere in the world to repair their iPhone. Finally, you don't just have to buy a new one um, or send it back to Apple. So, and, and that was because of pressure from the EU. I'm sure of it. I'm not at all convinced that Apple would have had an incentive to do that if it hadn't been for the EU pushing right to repair. So these kinds of standards are something where um, you can have a science policy interface. You can have really good scientific evidence which comes in. You can have it thoroughly assessed and, and uh, discussed by elected representatives, both of national governments and in the European Parliament. And you can come up with rigorous enough standards um, that the EU could set the standards for the rest of the world. But that also creates a big responsibility to the EU. That unlike with GDPR, which was largely created for um, the EU itself and then proved not to be so um, uh, robust in other jurisdictions, the EU has to think about how its standards are going to affect other markets, the, the, what's called the Brussels effect. Um, and that puts a big responsibility on the EU as the first mover to work with the US and potentially with China and others to define standards that will work everywhere because that's what we urgently need. The only way to stop the blah, blah, blah is to make climate commitments real and to make them um, 
account measurable so that then those who claim that they're doing them are accountable. Well, all the good that the EU can and is producing, even in its uh, sometimes modest ways. Heather, thank you so much. Welcome. That was a really excellent presentation. Thank you for all your questions and thank you for being with us.